It is the best-selling book in history. No volume ever written has been more loved and quoted. And its words, sometimes simple and sometimes mysterious, should always be studied carefully. It is the Bible, the Word of God. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, providing accurate and practical answers to all your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this broadcast, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, here's your host from Amazing Facts International, Pastor Doug Batchelor. Hello, friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? You might be surprised to learn that the largest desert in the world, it's not the Sahara or the Gobi, or even in Saudi Arabia. It's in Antarctica. It's called the Antarctic Polar Desert. And this desert is an ice sheet covering approximately 5.5 million square miles. Its windstorms get up to 200 miles an hour. Its temperature can plummet to minus 129 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet this freezing area is extremely dry and gets less than two inches of precipitation a year. Strangely, this polar desert sits on top of 70% of all the world's fresh water, but it's locked in about 6 million cubic miles of ice, averaging 7,000 feet thick. If this massive volume of ice should melt, it would raise global sea levels about 200 feet. How bizarre that the world's biggest desert should contain most of the world's fresh water. You know, the Bible says that God can provide water for his people even in the driest desert. Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, accurate and practical answers to your Bible questions. Welcome, listening friends. Bible Answers Live is designed to do our best to answer your Bible questions. If you have a Bible question, we have lines open. The number to call into the studio is 800 Four six three seven two nine seven. That translates to eight hundred. God says, and you could also watch the program. We're streaming on Facebook, and that would be the Doug Bachelor Facebook page, or the Amazing Facts Facebook page. And we invite you right now, if you call in with your Bible questions, excellent opportunity that you're going to get your question on tonight's program. We're dealing specifically with the Word of God. May not have all the answers on finance and romance. But we'll do our best to give you Bible answers. So if you have a Bible question, give us a call now. One more time, the number 800-463-7297. And my name is Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross, and good evening, friends. And as Pastor Doug mentioned, welcome to Bible Answers Live. And we're going to start with a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we thank you that we can take time and open up your word and study. No matter where we are, we know the Spirit is there. And so we do pray for your guidance and a clear understanding of what the Bible teaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, when you think of a desert, you think of a very hot place. I mean, you've got some of the great deserts of the world in Africa. You've got the Sahara Desert and many others. But the last thing that really comes to mind when you think of a desert is one of the coldest places on the planet. Uh, with a lot of snow and ice, you don't think of that as a desert, but sure enough. Uh, the biggest desert in the world. Yeah, very little rain. And <laughs> theoretically, if you don't have a way to melt the ice, you could die of thirst there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's surrounded by water, but it's frozen. <laughs> you know, it makes me think about how when the Lord led his people through the wilderness and they were there in that great, vast desert of the, uh, well, it may have been Saudi Arabia or the Sinai Peninsula. The, the jury's out about exactly what part of the desert wilderness it was that they ask for water. And Moses was instructed to uh, strike the wa rock and out came water. You know, it talks about this if you read in Isaiah chapter 35. It says, Then shall the lame man leap like the deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. For waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. There are several occasions in the Bible where God miraculously provided water you remember when Samson had his encounter and he killed a thousand Philistines, he said he was dying from thirst. And he said, Lord, here, you've given me this victory. I'm dying from thirst. 
And it says the Lord clave a place in the valley there and he was able to drink. When um, Hagar was wandering in the wilderness and she and Ishmael were dying of thirst, God miraculously gave them water. God gave water to Elisha when he was going through the desert and the angel provided. And then Jesus meets this woman at the well. She comes to draw water and he says, I've got water that if you drink the water I'm offering, and this is the Gospel of John chapter 4, it will be an artesian well of water springing up, satisfying your spiritual thirst. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but uh, that's what he was talking about, that living water that Jesus offers through the gift of salvation and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that water, friends, if you are thirsting for life, is available to everybody right now for the asking We've got a free book we'd like to make available tonight. If you'd like to know how to receive Christ and receive the Holy Spirit, and uh, all you have to do is call. The book that we have is called Life in the Spirit, and that is our free offer. We'll be happy to send that out to anyone who calls and asks. And we want to encourage you to take the time to give us a call because we'll be able to mail it to you, and you can actually have the hard copy in your hand. You can read it. You can share it to somebody else. To get that, just call 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line. Again, it's 800-835-6747. Ask for the book called Life in the Spirit, all about the Holy Spirit, and you'll be blessed. Well, Pastor Doug, we really go to the phone line. It's been a while since we've actually done Bible Answers Live. Live. I know a number of the folks who have been listening, you've probably the last few weeks have heard some, some encore, and that is because we've just finished up recently a Bible prophecy seminar. Yes. Revelation Now and... I know many of our listeners probably tuned into that, and we just want to, you know, mention how much of a blessing that series of le pr presentations or lessons were to so many people around the world. We want to let you know it's still available for free at the Revelation mm -hmm. Now website, and if you happen to miss any of those programs, take a look at that, and you'll be encouraged. All right, we've got George listening in New Jersey. George, welcome to the program. Welcome to Bible Answers uh. Live. Hey, good evening, pastors. Uh, evening. I did uh, see some of that. I did see some of that Revelation Now seminar, and I found it uh, since you're talking about it very enlightening and inspirational. So there's a few I didn't see, so I'll tr try to catch them, you know, on good. your site there. Thank you. But yeah, anyway, we're glad you saw uh, it. Yes, very good. Uh, tonight's question was on Ezekiel 32:21. Uh, how do we reconcile that with the idea that Sheol is supposedly a, a place of silence and unconsciousness. Um, that verse, and also near the end of Ezekiel 32, that talks about Pharaoh, who supposedly is dead, seeing his multitudes uh, down below, and he's comforted by them. How do we try to reconcile that with the belief of, of people being unconscious of death? It seems like a difficult verse, and I guess you're familiar with the one in Isaiah, too. Isaiah 14 is a little bit like that, too. All right, well, let's start, with, let's start with Ezekiel. And for those who are listening, I, I really need to read the verse so that they have the context. We always try and be mindful that so many of our friends listening are they're on the road. They're listening on satellite radio and can't, like, stop and reopen the Bible. It says here in Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 21, and it's a prophecy about Egypt being punished. Ezekiel, I just got done reading the book of Ezekiel. In this section of the book, he goes through a series of prophecies pronouncing judgments on the enemies of Israel. And he goes through everything from Tyre and the Edomites and the Ammonites and Egypt. And this is the prophecy specifically about Egypt here. And he said, the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with whose help they have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. So this is clearly speaking about those who are slain. But in these prophecies, the prophets are using a lot of symbolic and spiritual language. They're using a certain kind of poetry. And he's basically saying, your judgment is going to come. And if you're talking anymore, you're going to be talking out of the grave. And I, I don't think it's literally meaning that the slain are going to be talking to someone else from the grave. He's talking about a judgment. And I also think another point to mention here is the fact that they are in the grave speaks in and of itself that judgment came upon them, just like it speaks about the, the blood of, of righteous Abel crying out from the ground. Well, the blood didn't cry out, but the fact that he had been murdered, that cried out for justice. And so I think in right. the same way, here the enemies of God's people, they've been you know, vanquished and they're 
in the grave, so to speak, and that's justice. It demonstrates God's power. Yeah, if you read verse 18 of the same chapter, Son of man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth. Her and her mm -hmm. daughters of the famous nations were those who go down to the pit. And then again, it says down, they'll speak from hell. It's talking about the nation going to judgment. Uh, it's not really talking about any individual that's... Uh, and the word hell here is the word Sheol, which is often used for the grave. Right. So, I don't know if that helps at all, but... Uh, uh, yeah, Yes, it does. Uh, and, and Sheol, uh, the definition of that is really the state of the dead. It's not really a physical grave, right? Because there's other Hebrew words for grave, right? Is that well, true? that's correct. There are other words that they use for a physical grave. It's talking about... You know, when people go down, well, it's, I think it's also used for the grave, too. It's sort of the abode of the dead. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, I thank you. All right. Hey, thanks so much, thanks, George. George. Appreciate your call. Again, if uh, folks are listening and they're wondering about the subject of what happens when a person dies, we do have a study guide. It's called Are the Dead Really Dead? And uh, this is free. All you'll have to do is call and ask, and we'll be happy to get it in the mail and send it to you. The number is 800-835-6747. After the study guide, are the dead really dead? We've got Glenn listening in Ohio. Glenn, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for taking my call this evening. And uh, God oh. speaking through Isaiah in chapter number one seems to address two sets of new moons and festive days. When we go to 13, he talks about new moons and festive days and how they apparently did not do very well in keeping them. He was unhappy with it. But then in chapter four, or in verse 14, he talks about your new moons and your festive days, which I hate. Is it possible that prophetically he could be talking about such things as January, February, March, and Sunday worship, uh, Christmas, Easter, things like that? You know, well, that's a good question. I, I don't think this specific verse is talking about that. If you look, for example, in Isaiah 58, he talks about the hypocritical worship. He said, your fasting, it doesn't do me, it doesn't do you any good because you fast for strife. What kind of fast has the Lord chosen? And Pastor Ross might find that verse in Isaiah 58. He said, this is the fast that I've chosen to undo the heavy burden, to let the oppressed go free. So when they were going through the religious forms and ceremonies, and you're reading in chapter one here, keeping their new moons, keeping their Sabbaths, and keeping their sacred days, he said, uh, you know, my soul hates them. Verse 14 I'm weary of burying them. When you spread out your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers. And then he explains, uh, because your hands are full of blood. He said, so you're guilty of violence. And yet you say, oh, but, you know, it's like the people who crucified Jesus. They wanted to take the bodies off the cross so they could go home and keep the Passover. Well, what good is keeping the Passover if you've just killed the Messiah? Mm. I mean, you're not going to get points for that. So it's the same principle here. In uh, Isaiah, I think, the chapter The verse you're one. referring to today is number five. It says, this is the fast Ooh. that I've chosen. Isaiah 58, 5. 58, yeah. 5, yes. Yeah, I would just wonder, you know, when he talks about your new moons and your Sabbaths, I wondered if there was specific what he was talking about. It was different than his. No, well, I think he meant the way you're keeping it. Right, and it's also interesting to note that Jesus refers to the sanctuary when the Israelites apostatized. He spoke of the sanctuary as your sanctuary is less to you desolate. It's as if God said, all right, if that's the way you want to do it, it's not mine anymore, it's right. yours. And when Christ began his ministry, he says, my house is a house of prayer. Mm -hmm. But when they rejected Jesus and his teaching, he said, your house is left to you desolate. desolate. Yeah. So good point. Okay, thanks for your call, Glenn. Uh, Darla is listening in Alabama. Darla, welcome to the program. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, yes, and Pastor Ross, I wanted to say I have a friend who's gotten really into studying their Bible, which is a good thing, but they brought up Deuteronomy chapter 28 and really are pushing that black people are like the modern, they were the Israelites, the modern day Israelites based on what they've read, uh, Deuteronomy 28 verse 68, and I just, I, I didn't know, you know, they've been reading the book of Jeshur and a lot of different things. And I was just trying to see, um, are they on the right track or are there other verses that will give better direction or are there any books I can read? Yeah. I, I, 
heard of anything of this sort. Well, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, it's, this is the chapter of the blessing and the cursing, and 68 is still part of the cursing. And it's saying that if you turn away from me and stop keeping my commandments, and let me read this now, verse 68, the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships by the way of which I said you shall never see it again, and you shall be offered for sale. In other words, you will be slaves again. Well, everyone knows the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, but they didn't start in Egypt. They were not Egyptians. They were not from Africa. They came to Egypt from Israel during the time of Joseph, during the time of the famine, and uh, they were Semitic people. They were descendants from Shem. That's where you get the word Semitic. And so there is a sect of people out there that try to make a case that the ancient Jews were actually from Africa, and there's really no biblical evidence for that. And of course, we also need to recognize the Jews are not by any means the first nation of people uh, who were made slaves. Slavery has been around, seems like, from the very beginning, yeah. where one group of people is you know, enslaving another group of people. And that was typically what occurred during wartime. Mm -hmm. uh, those who were conquest in battle, often they would be sold for slaves. And so slavery is not limited to a particular group of people. Yeah, and of course, not only were the, the whole nation of Israel were slaves, with the exception of Moses, but before they ever got there, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, it says they had servants. Yeah. So, yeah, it was just sort of ubiquitous in the ancient world. But... Um, yeah, I've, I've run into some friends that they tried to make an argument and say that, you know, that history has been rewritten and the Bible has been corrupted, that the original Jews yeah. were actually from Africa. And, you know, I just, I don't see that in everything I've studied in history. It's very clear. Even DNA studies are very clear that um, the Jews were a Semitic people. They're related to the Arabs, who are also a Semitic people that descended from Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. And they came from Mesopotamia, just as the Bible said. He came out of Ur of the Chaldees. So anyway, you know, some, but if, uh, he, sometimes it won't matter how many scriptures you give a person if they don't want to believe it. There's nothing you can do. Anyway, I hope that helps a little bit, Darla, and appreciate that you're calling and listening. Are there any books that you know of that could help on this topic? Well, you know, you're always at a disadvantage when you're trying to disprove a lie. It's so much easier to point to the truth than try to prove a or disprove a counterfeit. Through familiarity with the account you find in Genesis, it's very clear. Um, you know, if you believe it, as soon as people say, well, it's been changed, well, you, how do you argue with that? Mm -hmm. But if you believe what it says about Abraham coming from Mesopotamia and his descendants went to Egypt as slaves and came back out of Egypt uh, during the Exodus, it's, um, yeah, that's what the Bible says. And I don't know that there's whole books on it. There probably are books out there now that I think of it because this is a, it's a common misunderstanding. You just maybe have to search the Internet. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. Wish we could help more. Thanks, Darla. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. All right, next caller that we have is Kennedy, listening from Rhode Island. Kennedy, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug. Hi, Pastor Ross. Great to hear from you guys again. Now. Likewise. So my question is more uh, towards holidays as far as, like, uh, as a Christian, what kind of holidays should we celebrate? Because sometimes I usually hear some controversy between um, Christmas or Valentine's and their backgrounds. And will that also be based based on your cultural background as to whether or not you should celebrate that as a Christian? Yeah, good question. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with if a person has a birthday, you get together, you thank the Lord for another year of life or having an anniversary. As far as nations go, if you're in a nation that is celebrating their freedom or whatever, there's nothing wrong with being patriotic as long as it doesn't you know, violate any biblical principle. In America, two extremes would be Thanksgiving is a holiday that was literally established. If you read the proclamation by Lincoln, he talks about thanking God, the Almighty, for his blessings and repenting of our sins is in his proclamation because he issued that during uh, the end of the Civil War. And um, But when you get to Halloween, that would be a holiday that I think Christians should. These are two opposites, of course. Uh, I think you know it's kind of steeped in spiritualism and the dead and if you don't give us a treat we do a trick and i don't think christians should uh, uh memorialize halloween so now when you get to things like christmas 
there's no nothing wrong with remembering the birth of Christ, but you can know with some certainty he wasn't born December 25th, so the date is not correct. I'd point you to Romans 14 at a time like this where it says in verse 5, one person esteems one day above another, another one esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. So if you're going to keep Thanksgiving, thank the Lord. If you're going to do anything about Christmas, don't make it about Santa Claus. Or if you're going to uh, observe Easter, do it as uh, to the Lord, thanking God for the, the resurrection. And actually, Easter is also the Passover season. So, you know, that's the advice that Paul gives. And if you don't, don't condemn a brother that doesn't. Um, what, what about Valentine's, though? Because sometimes Valentine's, and I did some research on, research on that as well, and it kind of seems like Valentine's was uh, more, you know, uh, was... I guess the origin of it is more like based on Mary's mother, as we know, based on the Roman Catholic, as they started the Reformation with Martin Luther, they you know, the keeping up the statues and things like that, and they started keeping the statues and then, you know, that commemoration with that. So any, any background in that as well, or any references? Yeah, well, again, if you're going to, if the world is using a day and they're saying this is the day to tell your wife or your girlfriend or somebody that you love them, is that violating a biblical principle? Now, it may be that, you know, some of these things sprang from pagan traditions. But um, if anything is not of faith, James says, if, if it's not of faith, it's sin. So if you've got doubts, don't do it. Um, but, you know, if you're comfortable, then and say, you know, I, I don't see that there's a violation of any principle in giving my wife a card with a heart on it, then uh, you might get extra points. <laughs> with your wife so yeah I, I and i i agree some of these things do spring from you know there's a lot of things we do that spring from pagan traditions that aren't necessarily bad uh, i don't know why we you know wear ties or shake hands there's no bible command bible says greet each other with a holy kiss but we shake hands so you know that can be traced from uh, certain european customs and there's nothing wrong with it uh there's no violation of principle so you know, if there's a custom, Paul says custom to whom custom is due, as long as it doesn't violate a biblical principle. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, thanks it. so much. I appreciate your question, Kendi. All right. We've got time for another caller. We've got um, Kathleen, I believe it is, in Arizona. Kathleen, welcome to the program. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Thank you both. Hi, Pastor Rosh, Pastor Bachelor. Um I want you to know that I pray for your ministry every night for safety and that you reach the whole world so Jesus can come. Oh, again. thank you so much. You're welcome. My question is about the ten virgins and why Why are there ten? Is Why not another number? And then why do the five wise tell the five foolish to go buy the oil when the, when the Holy Spirit cannot be bought? Well, they're basically saying, it's not that, that you can buy it. I think they're basically saying, you must get for yourself. And in a sense, you know, Jesus says, and I think Pastor Ross says, this is Revelation 3 when he says, I counsel thee to buy of me, mm -hmm. gold tried of the fire. Isaiah talks about something that you buy without money and without price. So you're right, you cannot buy the Holy Spirit with money. Peter said uh. to Simon, you know, you perish to think that you could buy the Holy Spirit with money. But when you surrender your heart, it's like David says, what shall I render to the Lord? Uh, I will give him my heart. And so, okay. you know, when we surrender our hearts to the Lord, and we invite the Holy Spirit. That's the kind of buying. And by the way, the parable of the 10 virgins for our friends that are listening is found in Matthew chapter 25. Um, as far as five. What do you think, Pastor Ross? Just the number 10, five wise, five foolish? Yeah, it's interesting. You've got five in the Bible. That often has to do with doctrine and teaching. You've got the first the five word, books, yeah. the Word of God. So here you had those who not only had an understanding of the doctrine, but they actually had the application of the truth. They had the Spirit within them. Mm -hmm. um, so 10, of course, you've got the Ten Commandments, which is a significant number. But you just got two groups. So those who profess followers of Christ, they all have the oil. They all have a certain amount of the oil, but the difference is... There are those who have the oil in the vessel, meaning mm -hmm. they have it in their heart. It's not an intellectual understanding, but it's practical. And I think five represents doctrine teaching. Yeah. It's like the uh, parable of the rich man. He says, I've got five brothers. It's talking about yeah. the Jews had the five books of Moses. Right. 
that all of them agreed on. Oh, that's a great point, Pastor. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, what's interesting is you've got this number five and you've got the wise and the foolish. And these were all believers that were looking for the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And yet, even amongst those who were looking for Christ's coming, there were those who were lacking in the, in the yeah. oil. And that's an important lesson, I think, even for us today. All right, maybe we can go to one more quick caller before the break. We have uh, Keisha from New Jersey. Keisha, we have just like two minutes. Hello, Pastor Doug and Pastor Ross. Good night. This is my first time calling in, so I am honored to be able to speak with you. Yes. Um, I have a question. I've been studying the Bible a lot, and I've been finding out new things. But there is something in Jeremiah 10, verses 3 to 6, that I'm having a little issue with. I, I want to know if this is about Christmas. All right, let's read that together. In Jeremiah chapter 10, I'll start with verse 3. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree in the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe, they decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They're up like, upright like the palm tree, but they cannot speak. They must be carried. Uh, Jeremiah here is talking about idolatry. People, the customs of the people, pagans, they would go cut a tree. They'd carve it into one of their gods. They'd plate it with gold and silver. They'd carry it around. People would pray to it. It really has nothing to do with the custom of the Christmas tree. Now, I'm not endorsing the Christmas tree. I'm just saying this verse is not about Christmas trees. It's about idolatry. And it's talking about, it says, these gods, they cannot go by themselves. That's verse 5. They cannot speak. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid of them. They can't do good. They can't do evil. So it's really about when they go and they take a piece. Of, and then Isaiah says the same thing. He said, you go and you cut a tree out of the woods. And he said, you take part of that tree and you cook your dinner. And you mm -hmm. take the other part and you make a god and you pray to it. And he said, it's a piece of wood. So there's several verses like this where they kind of, uh, they mock the people for their idolatry. It kind of like when I, Elijah said, you better shout to your God a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Mm -hmm. So they used to um, give the Baal worshipers a hard time. Hey, thank you very much for your call. I uh, appreciate that, Keisha. Hope it helps a little bit. By the way, we have a book we can offer you called Baptized Paganism that does talk about some of the pagan rituals and customs. And, and if you'd like to receive that, again, the number is 800-835-6747. As Pastor Doug mentions, it's called bap Baptized Paganism. And I think you'll find that interesting to call and ask for it. All right. Now, don't go anywhere, friends. We usually take a little break halftime. We catch our breath, get a drink of water, and you hopefully will think of some new Bible questions. Give us a call because we're going to do our best answers in the second half of the broadcast. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return shortly. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. For life-changing Christian resources, visit AFBookstore.com. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters, enhance your knowledge of the Bible, and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit BibleHistory.com. What if you could know the future? What would you do? What would you change? To see the future, you must understand the past. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined. The gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. 
This intriguing documentary, hosted by Pastor Doug Batchelor, explores the most striking Bible prophecies that have been dramatically fulfilled throughout history, Kingdoms in Time. Get your copy today. Available now on DVD, Blu-ray, or USB. For more information, visit KingdomsInTime.com. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, where every question answered provides a clearer picture of God and His plan to save you. So what are you waiting for? Get practical answers about the good book for a better life today. If you have a question about the Bible or living the Christian life, call us now at 800-GOD-SAYS. That's 800-463-7297. Now, let's rejoin our hosts for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends. This is Bible Answers Live, and if you joined us en route, this is a live international interactive Bible study, and we're on hundreds of stations, land-based stations, as well as satellite radio, and we just invite you to call in with your Bible questions, and we will do our best. We do see we have a few people standing by, but we still encourage you to call in because uh, we're going to try and get through as many questions as we can. My name is Doug Batchelor. My name is Sean Ross, and Pamela is listening. So we'll go to her in Alabama. Pamela, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, and good evening to both of you. Um, I have a question. How do you know when God stops hearing you or or quits trying to get you to come to him? Well, I think that, it, you know, the Bible says that where there's life, there's hope in the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Romans chapter 8, it tells us that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of mm-hmm. God. So uh, God is love. He still desperately loves you. And uh, I'm quite sure he has not given up on you. As long as you have an interest to turn towards God, the Bible promise in the book of James chapter 4 It says, if we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. And um, I'm sure that's how he feels about you too, Pamela. Were you asking for yourself or are you asking on behalf of someone else? Uh, uh, Pamela, I think we lost. Are you there? Yeah, uh, Pamela, can you hear me? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Were were you asking for yourself? Are you wondering sometimes if God has given up on you? I am, and also from someone else as well. Yeah. You know, the very fact that you're picking up the phone and asking us is an indicator that you are drawing near. You are reaching out Mm -hmm. towards God. Now, you may feel like sometimes he hasn't answered your prayers, and and there may be days that seem dark, but uh, God's love for you has not changed. I'll promise you that. And Jesus is still desperate for you to be saved. God so much wants to save you. He was giving giving his son, the life of his son, to do that. So never doubt his love for you. You know, how do you know if he hears your prayers? I mean, how, how I guess I really don't understand how it is that you're supposed to talk to him so that you know he hears you. Well, you don't have to speak louder because God knows what you think before you even pray. The praying is actually helping you draw near to God. God knows everything you think. He hears every prayer you pray. And and he will answer every prayer of faith. The Bible tells us Jesus is more willing to ask or to answer than we are to ask. Can I send you a book that deals with faith and prayer that I think might encourage you a little bit? I would love it. Okay, we're going to send you something special. And it's talking about the, uh, the gift of prayer. Yeah, we have a book called Teach Us to Pray. Yes. That's all about dealing with principles of making prayer meaningful. And you know, Pamela, we m- we'll send you two books. Uh, ask for the book Teach Us to Pray, but also ask for the book Assurance, Justification Made Simple. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of Christians out there or, or folks who are not quite sure if they are Christians. Maybe they have tried to confess their sins and maybe they've played with doubt. Well, this book will be an encouragement to you. So ask for the book Teach Us to Pray. It's about prayer. And then... Ask about the book Assurance, Justification Made Simple. And if you'd like to receive that, the phone line is 800-835-6747. 800-835-6747. And, uh, and those books are free, by the way. Yep. We'll, we'll send, just send them to you. Get in the mail, and, and you'll have it in a few days. 
Thank you. We have Mandy listening from Florida. There's a Melbourne in Florida. I know there's a Melbourne in Australia. Australia, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this one's probably a little <laughs> smaller. Yes. Mandy, you're on the phone. <laughs> Hi. I, I, I'm I, so happy to be talking to the both of you. Um, Doug, Mr. Doug Batchelor, I've been watching you ever since I was little little kid and my brother's a huge huge fan of you and um our family struggled so much but one thing my brother always clung to besides the bible was the the richest caveman book that he still has a copy of to this day oh wow well that's a an and, honor and it's a delight to talk to you <laughs> thank you thank you um i had so so many questions but i guess um since i can't really think of any i i'm uh, nothing that that I can feel like I could share over the okay. <laughs> over uh, the radio, but I do have one question that's been nagging me. Um, I don't want to say nagging, but has been thought provoking. Um, I'm reading in Ezekiel chapter eight. Yes. Um, and it's very very interesting in some of the language that uh, it uses, and quite specific actually. And I'm wondering. I, I noticed that in the old, old, old Testament, um, there's a lot of writing that refers to the end time prophecy, of course. But Ezekiel specific, I feel, and I don't know. If, I, I guess my question is: Is Ezekiel chapter eight pointing to the Antichrist system? Um, it, is that a future vision that points to the Antichrist system? That was my question. Okay, Sorry. Andy. No, no problem. Now, I'll have to encourage all those who are listening to read Ezekiel 8 because it's, it'll take quite a while for me to read the whole chapter to everybody right now. But it's a prophecy where uh, the prophet Ezekiel, who is in uh, Persia, he's in Babylon, and he is being shown what's happened. He was part of the captivity that was carried away early with Daniel. He's being shown some of the abominations that are being carried on where outwardly they're acting like they're serving the Lord, but inwardly they're actually still praying to Tammuz and false gods. Does some of this have to do with the last days? Well, there's some of the same principles that you'll see uh, in the last days where there's hypocrisy in the church and counterfeit worship. Ezekiel's being shown when a wall is broken through that leaders were, they were worshiping pagan gods. And so when judgment came on Israel back in the days of Ezekiel, when Nebuchadnezzar came back and he finally burned the temple and destroyed the city, he, Ezekiel was warning them this was coming uh, if they did not repent of their sins. So um, I think that primarily this prophecy is talking about what was happening among the people of Israel in his day. But there's some of those things that I think apply to the last days too. Yeah, isn't it interesting, Pastor Doug, that specifically the the sin that's highlighted here is these 25 men they have their back to the temple and yet they're bowing worshiping the rising sun <laughs> it's like sun worship <laughs> that's right and that's way back in israel's then of course all of the babylonians worship the sun and egyptians yeah. egyptians it crept even into some christian circles which is kind of interesting yep all right well thank you mandy appreciate your call we have jack listening from colorado jack welcome to the program Good evening. How are you? Good. Thank you for calling and your question tonight. Quick question. Probably a short answer. In Acts 2, verse 13, it says, Others mocking said, These are men, uh, these men are full of new wine, right? Uh huh. And I was uh, disputing with a man that, uh, not disputing, I guess, to talking. And he, uh, I was, he was saying, oh, Jesus turned the water into wine, fermented wine. I said, no, he turned it into new wine. He said, no, in Acts 2, 13, it says they, these men are drunk of uh, new wine. So could you clarify for me the difference between new wine, unfermented wine in the Bible? Yes, we'll, we'll do our just, best. Pastor Doug, my, let me just jump in here real quick, Pastor Doug. If you look at the word translated as new wine, it's directly the word means sweet wine or... Mm -hmm. It's not fresh grape juice. Th it's a different word. So it's translated as new wine, but it's more accurately translated as sweet wine or intoxicating wine. Of course, uh, the Passover uh, occurs, uh, or Pentecost occurs 
Um, 50 days after Passover. 50 days yeah. after Passover. But the harvest of grape was not until August. Mm. So they wouldn't have been mm -hmm. able to obtain fresh grape juice. So that new wine is not fresh grape juice. It's some kind of a fermented drink. And they're saying, well, these people are drunk. Yeah. And you know, I, I love that. Yeah. So, the, you know, clearly um, when Jesus said, I will not drink the fruit of the vine unless I drink it with you new in my father's kingdom. That there's mm -hmm. talking about grape juice. And that's at the Last Supper. So even at the Last Supper, Christ is saying that, um, you know, they would drink new wine. Incidentally, the word they new wine is translated from the Greek glucose. Sugar. That's the word. Yeah, glucose. Yes. Sweet <laughs> wine. Oh, I love it. So it was a different Thank word you. Now, than now pastors, fresh grape juice. Yeah. Quickly, quickly, I agree with both of you. I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and thank you so much. And the Revelation Now ceremony, uh, seminars have been just a blessing to my family, and thank you so much for all of that. I've signed up for the new AFCO thing um, that you guys did. I'm so excited, and well, thank great. you, and I believe. Yeah, it's hey, by great. the way, and so thank you for taking my call. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before you go away, though, there is a book we have that gives more answers on this in uh, more detail, and we'll send you a free copy, Jack. It's called Alcohol and the Christian. That's right. It sounds like you studied the subject, but you might want to share it with a friend. Uh, the Bible, or the, rather the, the phone number there is 800-835-6747. That's the telephone. That's the resource phone line. Call and ask for the book on alcohol and the Christian. We'll be happy to send it to you. And again, read it and then share it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. We've got John listening in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. John, welcome to the program. Thank you. Yeah. And your question. Um, so my question is, um, can sin transfer through generations? And if so, or if there's anything kind of relevant to that, is there a way um, to be absolved of that? If if you if you're feeling like maybe the sins of your fathers or forefathers that you're suffering for that somehow, yeah. All right, because well, I've asked for for. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You you don't have to worry that, you know, let's suppose y y your father, um, that he stole a bunch of money from uh, a, a, an employer or something, and that somehow now you are going to be paying for his sin. Uh, the Lord says in both Ezekiel, I think it's in the Law of Moses too, I think it's Ezekiel 18, the son... Well, let me, the son will not suffer for the penalty of the father, and the father will not suffer for the penalty of a son. And you can read it, it says, I'm um, in Ezekiel 18, 14. However, if he begets a son, if he begets a son which sees all the sins which his father has done and considers but does not do likewise, he's not eaten on the mountains, he's not lifted his eyes to idols, so forth. It says that, uh, uh, you know, he's not, he says he will surely live. He will not die for the iniquity of his father. Now I'm quoting word for word, verse 17. That son will not die for the iniquity of the father. He will live. It's basically saying that the righteousness of the righteous will be upon him. The only time it talks about generational sin is when the children pick up the habits of the parents and they, they reproduce the behavior of the parents. That's why it tells us in even the Ten Commandments, unto the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. So um, the only way that generational sin wor works is if a person follows in the sins of mm -hmm. their parents. And the verse you're referring to there in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, part of the Ten Commandments, talks about uh, iniquity till the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So it's interesting, Pastor, like you've got three different words in the Bible for sin. You've got mm -hmm. sin. You've got transgression, you've got iniquity. Iniquity carries with it sort of the, the motivation. It's the selfishness. And it seems as though it's quite possible for a child to, through observation, uh, in sort of inherit or receive that selfish, strong, selfish propensity. It seems to be carried on generation by generation. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Bible's warning against. It doesn't have to be that way, but it quite often works out that way if somebody doesn't... Um, put Christ in their life. Yep. They say your kids pick up your bad character traits. <laughs> yeah, so if you read Ezekiel 18, the main subject in that chapter is explaining the parents do not suffer for the sins of the children and the children do not suffer for the sins of the parents. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be real clear there. Thank you, John. I appreciate your question. 
All right, next yes, caller that we have is Ron, and he's a truck driver in Florida. Ron, welcome to the program. Hey, uh, good evening, Passes. How you doing? Doing great. And your question? Doing great. Um, appreciate appreciate your ministries. Uh, my question is um, John three thirteen. Um, some someone was trying to. I, I believe that Elijah and Enoch and Moses in heaven, but they were trying to use this text to say that they didn't go to heaven. John three thirteen. Yeah, it's a great verse. I mean, uh, Pastor, you jump in here too. But one of the ways I've understood this verse, Jesus is talking um, to Nicodemus here in John chapter 3, and the issue being referred to here is is truth. And um, he says, how can a man be born again when he's old? Jesus says, well, you're ruling Israel. You don't know these things. And then he says, no one has ascended up into heaven except him that has come down. And that's in the context of coming to share truth or share heavenly truth. Mm -hmm. um, it's true. You know, we have Elijah that went up to heaven, but he didn't come back. He never came back to teach people. Uh, Moses was resurrected, take you to heaven. He didn't come back and gather a group together and say, well, let me explain some of the doctrines. But Jesus came or down Enoch. from heaven. Or Enoch. Yeah. Jesus came down from heaven specifically to talk about heavenly things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's talking yeah. about, yeah, Jesus is the only one who came from the Father to reveal the truths of heaven. That okay, makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. It does. It does. I think my friend of mine. We we, we kind of came to that conclusion, but I thank you for that confirmation. I appreciate that. Thank All right. Hey, thanks so much for calling, Ron. Thanks. Appreciate it. And of course, Pastor Doug, um, Nicodemus would have known about Elijah going to heaven and Enoch going to heaven. I mean, that was part of the Old Testament. He was familiar mm -hmm. with that. And even Moses, because I think it was part of a uh, Jewish tradition yep, about the, the third assumption day being of Moses. Yeah. All right. We've got. Um, James in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan. James, welcome to the program. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> doing good. And your question? Good. I, yeah, yeah. I had a question. And, uh, I'll go through this real quick. Uh, I got a question about clean and unclean animals. It says in the Book of Leviticus. It's also because I've heard people saying like these vaccines are like the mark of the beast, so it kind of ties into the whole thing. But the book of Leviticus, it says that a pig and any fowl or bird that creeps upon the ground shall be unclean to you. You shall not eat it. And the pig gave us, like, swine flu that killed, like, 50 million people in 1918. Right. And the chicken carries 18 different types of flu. And then they're banning minks in Europe right now, these mink farms for fur, because they carry coronavirus. And then they think the coronavirus came from these wet animal markets in China, it had all these unclean animals like ferrets and bats and armadillos. Weasels, and bat. Yeah, yeah. And actually, so, it's a pangolin. It wasn't an armadillo. Pangolins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, but the thing that 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 gets me is we keep coming up with these vaccines, and instead of banning these unclean animals like pigs and chickens, or at least not having these factory farms that are all crowded together, we keep eating these animals, and we just come up with a vaccine every year, and we kind of go, oh, we got a vaccine now. We can keep eating unclean animals and having these factory farms, which spread disease. Now the antibiotics are getting drug resistant because the farmers use them so much. Yeah. And it's like the vaccines become kind of a It's our, uh, our, our, our remedy. Yeah, well, it's, it's exactly right. And it's right. a mark, too. It's it's like a mark that goes in your right hand, and you can also inhale them now. They have under your tongue, or you can inhale the vaccines like a spray, and it's in your right hand and it so in, and your forehead. So it is like it comes from the beast of the earth, and it's a mark we take in our arm, and then we keep abusing these animals. Well, and I'm, they're unclean animals I'm with that. you on the part about we're a lot better off if we don't eat these unclean animals. I don't think I'm... I'm with you that the mark of the beast is a vaccine in the hand and the forehead. And we do have a lesson. We'll send you on that. But, um, yeah, there's no question that it, it's odd that um, instead of dealing with the problem, so many of these uh, deadly viruses come from uh, humans living in close proximity with unclean animals, whether they're, well, you know, but I don't think, the, also... I don't think vaccines, you know, there were, there were millions of people saved from like smallpox vaccine years ago and diphtheria and others. And so I don't think vaccines are of the devil or they're the mark of the beast. Now, well, I don't know about this next vaccine. I mean, I, they, I hear they're doing right. some interesting they things in developing it. Yeah, yeah. Genes a little bit. Well, that's what I'm saying. In the Bible, it says the people that take the mark of the beast get a grievous sore on the right hand or the forehead. 
And it also says the beast makes people take the mark of the beast in the rain or, or they can't buy or sell. And they're kind of talking about stuff like that now. Like you got to get the vaccine to go on a trip or you got to get a vaccine to go maybe to a restaurant. I don't know. So it's, it's all. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you look at that. But, you know, in the in the broader context, Revelation is about worship. That, that's the right. key issue. Who are we going to worship? And so are we going to worship the beast? Are we going to worship God? But it is interesting how that uh, political powers can just influence the populations of the world overnight. You know, we do see a battle taking place in the Western world between uh, states and and mm -hmm. religion, a lot of religions are saying we need to meet and worship, and the right. states are saying you can't because of the f the virus, and that they're you know having Supreme Court cases dealing with that right now. And so, uh, I can see where uh, certainly through the pandemic, certain issues have come to a head, and it seems like a lot of Americans have lost. Even Judge Alito said we're losing freedoms. People are getting used to surrendering freedoms to the states mm -hmm. uh, because of the the excuse you know the pandemic can be used as an excuse for many things. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, it is an issue to, um, I think, be alert to. Yeah. So uh, if I see people breaking out with sores after the vaccine, I know I'm not getting it. You won't be the first in line? No, I'm not, <laughs> not going to be. I don't want, you know, one, they say don't be the first one to download new software. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm not going to be the first, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, James. We appreciate your call. We have Emily in Washington. Emily, welcome to the program. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for calling. Both of you. Thanks for taking my call. I have a, a question about Luke 17, 3. Okay. That's been bothering me for a while. It says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So what happens if he doesn't repent? Then I don't have to forgive him? What's the word if doing there? Well, that, that's a good point. Uh, by the way, I have a message on forgiveness. You can uh, watch for free at YouTube if you just type in Doug Batchelor and it's called 70 times 7, uh, because it, it's a big issue. How does a Christian deal with forgiveness? There's two things that are happening. One is, when you forgive another person, what does it do for them? And then, when you forgive, what does it do for you? The idea of being unforgiving, did Jesus wait until his killers apologized before he forgave them? Or did he say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they mm -hmm. do? So you can choose to forgive a person even if they don't repent. It doesn't mean now someone steals from you and they don't apologize, you know, don't lend them any more money because you, <laughs> you're not helping them, you're not helping you. But you don't want to be bitter against them forever because that bitterness, you know, poison corrodes the container that holds it. Uh, so you might need to forgive them and let it go for your own spiritual health. You don't have to ever be involved or trust them again. And also forgiveness carries with it a degree of restoration. The relationship is being restored. And mm -hmm. I think that's the context here right. of, you know, if if you confront him and he recognizes the fault and repents, then you can restore the relationship. So uh, forgiveness in that sense is not only just forgiving, but it's a restoration of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Hey, thank you so much. Um, now, we do have, um, like I said, that uh, video you can watch for free. It's called 70 times 7. Just type, type in Bachelor, and that's B-A-T-C-H-E-L-O-R, 70 times 7. And I spend about 45 minutes talking about forgiveness there. I've heard that sermon several times, Pastor. I think it's one of my favorite. Got I only know two points. sermons. You probably heard them all. <laughs> <laughs> that one I remember. That was a good one. <laughs> all right, we've got Gail in Canada. Gail, welcome to the program. Gail, you with us? You might have your mute on, Gail. We'll give you one more chance here. Gail in Canada, LaRange, Canada. Hello. There Hello? she is. Okay. Yeah. You made it just under <laughs> yeah, the on mute. We got a minute and a half. Can we do a quick question? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I have a question. In heaven, you've mentioned in your um, revelation now that God winks at some of our sin mm -hmm. so i'm not sure jacob has two wives Rasha and leah so is he going to have two wives in heaven and there are also people that has tattoo but they have already accepted christ so but you but it is stated in the bible that um we will be having glorified bodies so i don't know how to perceive that <laughs> 
Yeah, well, two questions. Uh, when it comes to uh, being in heaven, I doubt that Solomon's going to have all 700 wives and 300 concubines in the kingdom. You know, Jesus talks about that when, I think it's in Matthew, Pastor Ross, where he said, uh, those who are worthy to obtain the resurrection neither marry nor are they given in marriage, but there is the angels. So Jacob in heaven is principally going to be married to the Lord. It's it's not that uh, he's he'll probably have a good relationship with Rachel Lee and the others, but it's not going to be like earthly marriage there. Uh, as far as tattoos, you know, people come to the Lord with all kinds of sins and scars and um, that they may have obtained in their former life. The Lord accepts us the way we are. And you just come, as the song says, just as I am, without one plea. And so if a person's, <laughs> we, we had a friend that was covered with tattoos, literally from head to foot. He, he had tattoos, but all kinds of interesting tattoos. He said, Pastor Doug said, you know, if I try and get all these removed, and he didn't actually try to remove several of them. He said, it's going to be very painful. And he said, I'm going to look pretty bizarre. And he just, he had a dramatic conversion. And, you know, he's going to get a new body tattoo mm -hmm. free when he come when Jesus comes. So uh, you just, you know, the, you come to the Lord the way you are. And and. Uh, yeah, that's his it. mother might be the only one that recognizes him at <laughs> first in heaven. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so new bodies for people out there. And if you've got tattoos, you know, you just come to Jesus. It says, yeah, you shouldn't do it. But if you did it, and you didn't know mm -hmm. God winks at our ignorance. He accepts us the way we are. And then uh, I wouldn't go get any new tattoos. Right. So, hey, friends, you know, I want to be fair to take another question because we're coming up on the close of the program. We do, by the way, if you do stay by, we have some important announcements I think that you'll be blessed by. And take a look at Revelation Now, the program we just recorded. It's at the website, revelationnow.com. You can view all those programs on Prophecy. It talks about where we are in history now. It's all free. God bless. We'll study his word together again next week. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts International, a faith-based ministry located in Granite Bay, California. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan the arch-villain, the birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com. If you'd like to enhance your study of God's Word, visit our website at www.amazingfacts.org and sign up for our free Bible study course. And make sure to check out our online bookstore at afbookstore.com, which offers thousands of inspiring books, DVDs, and more to help you get the most out of God's Word. To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Did you enjoy this program? Make sure to tell your family and friends. Tune in next time for more Bible Answers Live. Honest and accurate answers to your Bible questions.